Well, the question I asked at the top of the printed page that you have, do you have a biblical worldview? And uh, some of the things I'm going to say you've already heard, but just want everyone to be on the same page and catch up with what we're saying and doing. Um, in America, and what we're talking about, not the world, but what's happening in the United States where we live, according to George Barner, who's a professor at Arizona Christian University, and he's been doing uh, research projects, a uh, number of people work on his staff, and he did a uh, American Worldview Inventory in 2021 and also 2022. So the information that I'm sharing with you is current. And he says this, of all the people in America, and I think the, America's population is around 350 million. I might not be 100% correct on that, but 350 million people, only 6% of the people in America follow Jesus. Only 6% of the people in America uh, believe this is the Word of God. Only 6% of the people in America believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. Only 6% believe that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. Only 6% believe that God is a omniscient, omnipresent, powerful, God who rules in the earth today, and only 6% believe that there are biblical moral absolutes. And so 6% of the 350 million people in America is approximately only about maybe 2 million people who are truly born again. Now, when we use the word Christian, in America, it's a generic term. And to really find out if a person is really truly born of God, you have to redefine things and question things. Not that we're saying we are the righteous judge in the earth, but people who truly live their life based on the truth of God's word. So what do the other 94% believe? I mean, what is their belief system? What, what do they hold to? And the answer to that is a term called syncretism, meaning a mixture. So a lot of people, 94% of the people in America, their belief system, what they believe, is eclectic. You get a little bit here, a little bit there, for this worldview, this worldview, and then you just kind of put it together. I want to say, and you want to say, that my worldview and how I see things and believe and understand is based upon the truth of God's Word. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't even know what the worldview is. When you say the world, I mean the word worldview, a lot of people say, what? What are you talking about? I remember uh, four years ago having a conversation with a fellow high school classmate, and when I used the word worldview, he didn't know what I was talking about. And he's, this guy was an intelligent person, well-educated, and um, he did explain his worldview even though he didn't know what it was. His worldview was Secular humanism. And that worldview says essentially that uh, I don't believe God exists. My world is determined based on what I see within myself. And I'm essentially a God unto myself. I put my faith and confidence in science and in technology. And that's how I understand and see life. Sad thing about that is that person has no hope beyond the grave. And so just so we understand where we are, if you're looking at Roman numeral two in my sermon notes, as I mentioned, everybody has a worldview. So what is a worldview? It's a filter. It's 
through which you experience, interpret, and respond to the world. It is, in essence, your decision-making filter. Okay? So here's how it works. In the book of Matthew, chapter 15, Jesus is talking about a worldview there, even though you won't see the word worldview there. And what he is saying, he says, what really defiles a man is not what's out there. He says, it's, it's not all these philosophies and ideas, all these things roaming out there. He says, actually, what defiles a person, what is within their heart, their belief system. From that belief system, he says, comes forth of how you understand and perceive and interpret things in the world. So everyone has this filter. And so you're interacting and doing things, say, in your family, in the church you live in, where you work, and how you move through life. What you believe will determine how you make decisions. And hopefully your belief system is based upon the Word of God. And a lot of people today, even in the church, don't have a good understanding about the Word of God. Now, talk about the issue of abortion. A lot of people don't know what the Bible says about abortion. You won't find the word abortion in the Bible. So you have to dig into the Word of God to get the heart and mind of God to develop a filter system, how you interpret things. I was talking to a, uh, a Christian, supposedly a person said they were a Christian, about a couple of months ago, and talking about the issue of abortion. They had no idea what the Word of God said about the subject of abortion. And so their filter system was based upon a combination of what they heard through social media, through acquaintances, friends that they know, um, also based on what they maybe read or see or hear. But what we need to do as believers, get our information, get our belief system based on the truth of God's word. So their position concerning abortion had no idea what the Bible said about it, but what they perceived based upon their belief system that a woman should have the right to do what she wants to do with her body. When I came to Jesus, when you came to Jesus, and you forfeited your life, and said, God, not my will be done, but your will be done. So as you read the scriptures, and you see from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, statement after statement where God says, and he hates this, the shedding of of innocent blood, I abhor. Now that's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Particularly in the book of Proverbs, the 11th chapter. God says, yea, there are six things I hate, yea, seven. And one of them is the shedding of innocent blood. A baby in the womb is a living being. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that we're wonderfully made and designed by God Almighty. He knew us before we were even in the womb. He, John the Baptist, Elizabeth, his mother, said all of a sudden when she was having communication with her cousin Mary, the mother of Jesus, the baby leaped in her womb, John the Baptist, was alive, innocent as far as being able to discern what's right and wrong. A baby is, doesn't have the developed 
conscience where they can decide what's right or wrong, totally dependent upon the mother. The Christian life says this, that as you relate to people, what you do, follow the example of Jesus, you put yourself back here and prefer others over yourself. That's a character quality of the word of God of Jesus. And so you have this baby within the womb and surely the maternal instinct would want to protect and provide safety for that child. Inconvenience yourself. If you're going to follow Jesus, we would want to do that, that we would prefer others over ourselves. We see that in the scriptures, in the book of Romans, the 14th chapter, it talks about honoring, preferring others. The relationship between a man and woman, which gives longevity to a marriage, is where a man honors his wife and puts her above himself. That gives longevity to any relationship. And so what has happened, a majority of people in America, their world view is completely the opposite of what a biblical worldview is. For example, in my life, I believe in honoring God with my tithes and offerings. And so therefore, every Sunday, I write a check and I give it unto the Lord. I got that understanding, that belief system from the Word of God. Now, a lot of Christians say they have a biblical worldview, but to be honest with you, their tithe is not even a tithe. It's a fraction of a tithe. I think, generally speaking, the statistics says the average amount a person gives per week is about $2 and some odd cents. Now, do you believe the Word of God or not? Do you trust God or not? I want to say, Lord, I trust you and that if I have to give sacrificially, I'm going to believe and trust, Lord, that you open the windows of heaven, that you pour out a blessing. I don't have enough room to contain the blessing of God. We just prayed for people this morning that God would administer healing to them. What price could you put on good health? I think one of the blessings of honoring God in my life and your life is the Lord sustains us. Amen? Strengthens us. We can get up in the morning and say, Hallelujah! It's fall. Amen? The heat's been turned down. Glory to God. Amen? And I want to say, Lord, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like some of the patriarchs of the Bible. Their eyes were not dim. Moses didn't start his ministry until he was 80. Hallelujah. I'm only 75. I got five more years than I can start ministering. Hallelujah. Amen. His eyes were not dim. He didn't walk around like this, you know. And I'm not putting anyone down. But I want to say, Lord is my strength. The Lord is my health, my healer. Amen. I'm going to put him first in my life. My filter system. It's based upon my understanding of the Word of God. That's why I read the Word of God every single day. I have read through the Bible a number of times, and I still don't fully understand everything. I'm still a student, a neophyte, a beginner. I think even when I step into eternity, I'm still going to be in school, probably in school the rest of my life, throughout eternity. God is outside of space and time. There's no end to him. He is the beginning. He is the end. The Alpha and the Omega. Amen? And so, I want to say, Lord, in every aspect of my life, that I'm living a life that's a biblical worldview, and I'm following Jesus. He tells us in Romans 8, 29, that the ultimate purpose he has for you and me is he's in the process of conforming us under the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. He wants us to exemplify and be like the Lord Jesus Christ in the way we think and behave and process life and deal with life. 
Amen? You see, God places us on the earth. He's redeemed us, saved us more than just going to heaven. Hallelujah. But what about the rest of your life and what you do here in preparation for eternity? That you live your life according to the word of God. Amen? Amen? And so, there are seven worldviews. And very quickly, I'm just going to give you a, a run-through and a quick synopsis of these not, without going into a lot of detail. Because I said only 6% of the people in America have a biblical worldview. 94% of them have something other than that. A lot of these worldviews, for example, like a postmodernism, represent maybe 1% of the population. But you got all these seven worldviews and what 88% of the people have what they call a mixture, a, syn a syncretic conglomeration of taking a little bit of postmodernism or moral therapeutic deism or they take biblical theism or Marxism and they just kind of get a hodgepodge and then put it together and that's how they understand and interpret things. Real simple. Your belief system, what you truly, really believe, goes from your belief system to your mind, your soul. And there you process things, and out of that becomes your behavior, how you relate. A lot of young people, millennials, the ages of 18 to 36, according to George Barna, this is not true for everybody, this is, you know, a general term explanation. Essentially have this epitaph or this cliche or saying in their mind, I don't know, I don't care, I don't believe God exists. Essentially, a majority of these worldviews, people are essentially living unto themselves and have asked God, depart from me. Two-thirds of the churches in America are declining. One-third are plateaued. But there's Places where you see mercy drops here and there, a broader perspective, you see God moving in a powerful way in Asia, in the Middle East. Christianity and Iran is just taking off like a rocket ship. You would never think that. You won't hear that on social media. You won't hear that on the evening news where there's extreme persecution of the church, the church is exploding. What do we need in America? What, we, what do we need in America that will wake us up? I was, received a communication from my friends in Ukraine where all the things they consider so valuable, their job, their career, their house, their assets, gone. Most people have fled the neighboring countries with what they could carry or on their backpack. He said, Sasha said to me, who lives in Rivna, Ukraine, he says, what the war's done is caused Christians to really live out their faith. It's caused Christians to begin to pray. It's caused preachers to have two or three services today. It's caused people to get on their knees and face before God and begin to pray and call out on the Lord God. He says, it's allowed the church to wake up and really begin to live the life of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Their worldview has been dramatically transformed. Now, sometimes God in his mercy will bring judgment upon a nation like he did his chosen people, Israel, because 
they begin to worship the gods of the Moabites or the Ammonites or the gods of the Philistines, thinking it would give them a better place of position in God and have forsaken the Lord God Almighty. God, out of his mercy, brought judgment through a pestilence, a famine, through a war or an economic decline to get their attention, not to annihilate them, but to bring them to repentance. Are you willing to see that happen to America that maybe we have to have something that will bring us to our knees so we could have a move of God that people be born of the Spirit of God? Because when something like that happens, the righteous suffer along with the unrighteous. And don't give me that eschatology you're going to say, well, when the great tribulation comes, God's going to snatch me out and let the rest of them suffer. I've got people in my family, my extended family, that I want to see them come to Jesus. And I want to be here to say to them, you need a personal, intimate relationship with God Almighty. Don't follow the ways of the world. Don't be deceived by Satan and think that you can justify yourself by your good deeds. Most people in America believe that the way you get to heaven is based upon your good merits and your performance that you've done some good things and God will see that and have mercy on you. Meaning you get to heaven through works of righteousness. Not going to happen. My Bible says salvation is by grace through faith in the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you can't earn it, you can't buy it. There are none righteous, no, not one. We need a Savior, amen? To be a little more specific, just real quickly, biblical theism. Biblical theism is a biblical worldview where you believe that Jesus lived a sinless life. You believe the Word of God is the truth. You believe in moral absolutes. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not covet. Thou shall not lie. And the list goes on and on. And those are biblical absolutes of moral principles that we adhere to. Also, biblical theism believes that salvation, as I already mentioned, is by grace through faith and not of works. You believe that God is the creator of the universe, that he exists, that he rules today, that he's a sovereign God. Amen? So essentially, biblical theism means you live your life and follow Jesus as the master, the Lord of my life. Secular humanism essentially is naturalism, atheism. It means I'm a God unto myself. When I die, based on secular humanism, that's the end. I just become another piece of fertilizer in the garden out there. What kind of a, a belief system is that? So, so when people adhere to secular humanism, they're essentially saying they're a god unto themselves. And then there's moralistic, therapeutic deism. Boy, that sounds good. Deism essentially means God started everything and then he stepped back and just turned it over to humanity. God does not involve himself in the affairs of man's life. The greatest intervention, involvement of God in human affairs was the incarnation. When Jesus, representing the Godhead, came in human flesh, identified with us, became our Savior and the master of our life and paid the price for sins, the consequence of sins, the second death, the wrath of God, and redeemed us and set us free. 
Deism does not believe that and that we're on our own and we're going to have to make the determination based on our moral principles and how we're going to better ourselves. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He did a lot of good things, but it's sad that he was a deist. When you look at postmodernism, and that's where they've done away with traditional values and principles, such as marriage. Today, people want to redefine marriage based on their belief system. You can raise a family. You don't need a male sperm and a female egg. We'll do it our way. And postmodernism has no moral absolutes. Truth is what you decide what is true. You don't adhere to anything of the past. The Bible is out of date. It's not relevant. Postmodernism says truth is subjective. You determine what the truth is. So you're driving down the road one day, you know, I'm a postmodernist. And you know what? Every red light is green. No matter what the red light says, as far as I'm concerned, the truth is every red light is green and I'm barreling through. And so truth becomes not objective, subjective, and I'm going to determine what's right and what's wrong. That is messed up. That's messed up. Then you have nihilism, and where they essentially have thrown away everything that was concrete based on the truth of God's word and essentially comes to this conclusion, life has no meaning. Zero, zilch. And does away with everything. I mean, there's no hope in that. And then there's Eastern mysticism. And a lot of people embrace what they call karma, Christians. And, and karma is essentially saying that um, I will determine my life. And what has transpired in the past will determine what's going to happen in the future. And you know, it sounds kind of good. My karma has determined my destiny and my fate. Well, as a believer, I don't buy into karma. I don't buy into Eastern mysticism because what happened, if I get what I deserved and standing before a righteous, holy God, I'm going to lose. You see, God didn't give me what I deserve. He gave me faith in him to believe and know that when I expire, that I will step into the eternal presence of God. So a karma is essentially saying that my actions determine my future. My good works will never get me into heaven. I needed someone to rescue me, to rescue you. And if I get what I deserve, I'm going to bust hell wide open because my righteousness is as filthy rags. I can't justify myself. So Eastern mysticism, a lot of people believe that they're going to be reincarnated. Hinduism, Buddhism, essentially is saying that through your own good efforts, and your pious, holy condition is that you're going to come back a better person. And that's why a lot of times they won't sacrifice this monkey, this cow, this person, because that might be my uncle. I was at my house the other day, and there was a roach on the table. I said, I can't kill them. It might be my uncle. Well, you know, you know what I did with that roach? I have a biblical theistic viewpoint. I killed that roach. 
The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Whack! You know, Marxism. That's socialism. A lot of people today are grabbing towards Marxism and they're saying, the government can take care of me. I deserve these entitlements. Give me free education. Give me a welfare system. Take my property. Take my career. Take my savings. Redistribute it so everybody can be happy. It won't work. My friends in the former Soviet Union saying, what's wrong with the people in America? 70 years of socialism, look what it got us. Huh? I would say to the person who has the biblical I mean, it has a worldview based on Marxism. Move to Cuba and get you a 1954 Chevy. Drive that around for the rest of your life. And then you see syncretism. That's essentially people, unfortunately, 88% of the people in America have a synchristic worldview. It's a mixture. Here's what Jesus says about it in Revelation, the third chapter, about syncretism I would prefer that you would be either hot or cold not a mixture not lukewarm because if you are I'm going to spit you out syncretism will not work and so what I'm saying to you today and I say to myself Lord I want to make sure my belief system is based upon the truth of God's word and if I have a let some other philosophy or some other worldview to encroach upon my mind, I repent, God. Let me have a sound understanding of a belief system based upon the Word of God. That's why New Life Church, along with a bunch of other churches, ours included, started a school of discipleship. Because in the church today, there is biblical illiteracy. The Bible addresses everything we're dealing with in this life. And a majority of people in the church today don't know what's in this book. I've had people, I read through the Bible one time, and, and I, I comprehended everything. Say what? Then I'd say to them, you turn to the book of Hezekiah, chapter 6, verse 4, and they go through their Bible looking for Hezekiah. Hezekiah is not a book in the Bible. He was a king in Judah. Or say to them, what are the four Gospels? Let's see, I think it's Colossians, Ephesians, no, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Georgia Electric Power Company. No, that's not it. I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, trying to uh, ask you some hidden name or situation in the Bible, but you have a good grip on the Word of God. And so well, your decision-making process is based upon your understanding of a belief system based upon the truth of God's word. Can you say amen? Now, 10, I just want to share this with you. I, I got this from uh, George Barner's recent book he put out talking about worldviews. He said there are 10 seductive, unbiblical ideas that are embraced Americans. I mean, a lot of people think that what they're believing and what they're saying is found in the Word of God. One of the warnings Jesus gives us as we approach the end times, be careful that no man will deceive you. He says that in Matthew chapter 24. He says that in the book of First Thessal Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So here's 10 on biblical ideas. Having faith matters. Amen. We need faith. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The only way you please God is by faith. God rewards those who diligently seek Him. Amen. But then it goes a little bit further. 
Having faith matters more than what faith you have. So you need to have faith, but it doesn't matter if it's moralistic, therapeutic deism. It doesn't matter if it's Eastern mysticism. It doesn't matter if it's Christianity. If it doesn't matter, it's this. It doesn't matter that. What is? It does matter. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't find it in vain philosophies of the world. You can't base it on the deception and the ingenuity of the human mind. All faiths are equal value. Nope. What does the Bible say? The Bible talks about Christianity is particularism, exclusivity. The only way that anyone can be reconciled to God is through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one mediator, the Bible said, between God and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, people who have a different worldview than what we have will say, well, you think you're an elitist. You're arrogant. You're not giving anyone else in the world any of the other worldviews an opportunity. When you research Mormonism, when you research Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, they are exclusive also. Islam says our means of, of salvation is through the sword and not through the power of love through God Almighty. And if you don't adhere to Shira law, then they're exclusive also. The same with other worldviews. So to say that we're the only one because we say the only way to God the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is true. I can't atone for my sins. You can't. I need forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is the one who paid the price. You see, God isn't way up there like the deists would say, well, God doesn't mess with us. He started it. He abdicated his responsibility. Now it's up to us to earn our way into heaven. He is here presently. Amen? It says here, believe in karma. You, here's what karma says. You get what you give. Your actions determine your fate. Oh, baloney. I already addressed that. If, if my salvation... My entrance into heaven is based upon my good deeds and works. I have no hope. My guiding light in my life is not my karma. It's Jesus who's the light of the world. Amen? He's the one who guides us, directs us. He, through the Holy Spirit, will comfort us, reassure us. The Holy Spirit is the one that convicts us. He's the one that reveals the consequences of eternal damnation. He's the one that reveals the truth of righteousness. My God is my Redeemer. He's my Savior. He's yours also. Amen? I'm not dependent upon karma to get me through life. Or candy karma. Or whatever you want to call it. There, here's another unbiblical idea. There are no absolute truth. All scriptures give my inspiration. God is profitable for doctrine, proof, instruction, and righteousness. That's what the Word of God says. I remember on a plane one time, years back, and Diana was not sitting with me. She's sitting a couple seats back. I was in first class. She was in economy. No, no, <laughs> no. And some guy was sitting next to me who just came from a seminar here in Atlanta with a Dalai Lama. And he gets all excited, and he's giving me all these revelations, and I'm listening to him. So he would give me a revelation the Dalai Lama gave him. I would give him the Word of God. 
So everything he would say, I would come back and said, hey, I understand what you're saying, but I'm sorry, you're not correct. Here's what the Word of God says. Then he would say, well, here's what the Word of God says. And the only reason I could say that and know that because I was well equipped with the Word of God. You don't need to be a seminary graduate to share the Word of God. You just need to have a loving relationship with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ and eat His Word each and every day. And not become offensive. And I didn't offend that guy. I would say to him, it's interesting you would bring that subject up because let me share with you what the Word of God says. And Dinah said, you were talking so loud everybody on that airplane heard you. I said, I did that on purpose. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So what did he get mad at me? Too bad. Amen. Um, here's another interesting one. All moral truth is personal and subjective. God forbid. Man, I, I need God to speak to me. You know what success is? It's being able to hear the word of God and obey him. Amen. So, if I'm trying to interpret my life and how I should behave and how I should conduct myself based upon my own personal insight from taking a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit of this over here, I'm going to have a mixture. God hates mixture. You see it in the Old Testament where he said to Israel, you stay within your own camp. Drink water from your own sister. And don't go after this woman or that woman. You be a one-man woman. You drink from your own sister. Don't go out there like Solomon did and marry this woman from this country and this country and that country. And so what Solomon did, the wives he married because there was a mixture, he was led astray. He did not end well. Now that's in the Bible. It didn't say the word syncretism in the Bible, but it talked about a mixture. And he says, you're holy people. He says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. That means don't have a worldview based upon syncretism. Don't have a mixture. You're in the world, but not of the world. Amen? So we don't buy into all these vain philosophies. Amen? Amen? People are basically good. Most people in America think he's a good old boy. He's a good old girl. What does the Bible say? Give me a scripture. Amen. Romans 3.23. Amen. Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. You know what it says, all those scriptures? Paul was quoting David in Psalm 14. There are none righteous, no, not one. None righteous. We have all moved away from God. The nature of man is depraved. There are none righteous. Now, when you come to Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 takes place. That says this. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So when you become a believer, what God does, he imparts to your being, to your nature, his righteousness. That doesn't mean you won't make mistakes, but you're on the road to being predetermined, predestined to become more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Success is determined by happiness, comfort, goodness, or fulfilled potential. You know what Jesus said about that? I remember the prosperity message infiltrated the church. God loves you. He wants you to be a millionaire. So go buy a lottery ticket so you can become a millionaire. Your life is based and determined upon your comfort zone upon 
this, that, your potential. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, your life does not consist in the abundance of things which you possess. Your life, your value is not determined where you live, what car you drive, or where you went to school. When you take your last breath and close your eyes for the last time, I'm not taking my seminary degree from New Orleans Seminary with me. I'm not taking my honorable discharge from the Air Force. That was the hardest thing I earned. Right, Greg? <laughs> Lord, deliver me. <laughs> and so all those things you think were so important really don't identify who you are. What identity do you take into eternity? What possession do you take into eternity? Only what you possess in Jesus. The character qualities that's been instilled in you through following Jesus, loving God. Lay not treasures on earth. Don't make your investment in all those things. Not saying that having a nice home, a car, and all those things is not important. But lay up treasures in heaven where no one can steal it, no moth or cockroach can destroy it, where no thief can take it. Make your investments in eternal things, how you relate to people, how you conduct yourself in relating to your family and friends, how you conduct yourself, how you live. Let your light shine. Be the salt and light of the earth. Amen? Follow Jesus. Pray. Call on the name of the Lord. Trust in him. Amen? Those things have eternal value. Sexual relationships apart from marriage are morally acceptable. A lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that. There's nothing wrong with me camping out with this young lady. Before we get married, I need, just like I do when I buy a car, I got to test drive it first, make sure it works. And if, if it, you know, passes my, you know, quality control methods, then, hey, look, we can get married. People, people look at relationships based upon that, that thinking, that worldview. Now, everyone here has messed up at some point in time. Even if you haven't committed a sexual sin and actions in your head, you have in your mind. In my mind, I probably broke every one of the Ten Commandments. In my mind, I have killed people. I, I got that from Clint Eastwood. Where he says, are you going to sing Dixie or are you going to pull out your pistols? You know, it's, I mean, in your mind, Jesus said, if you have thought it, you have conceived it even though you haven't acted out. So I say, Lord, purge my mind, clean my mind. Not only my conscious mind, my subconscious mind. You know what I do when I get some stupid, ungodly thought? How I combat it? I begin to pray in the Spirit. You know what? When I do that, the enemy, he flees. That's one of the most difficult things to discipline is your thought life. And I have to, Paul said, he was honest in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things I should do, I don't do. And the things I, I shouldn't be doing, I do those things. Who can deliver, deliver me from this carnal flesh? My victory is in the Lord Jesus. Amen? People are not inherently sinful. The wages of sin is death. There are none righteous, no, not one. That, that goes back to a fourth century unbiblical concept put out by a priest named Pelagius. He did not believe or teach original sin. We all come to this world with a nature that is broken. We have a nature that is sinful. And what we do we follow that nature until God comes and redeems us 
And he's the one that gives us faith. He's the one that redeems us. He's the one that calls us unto him. He's the one that loves us, transforms us. Salvation is not initiated by you and me. God is the initiator. Then we respond and say, yes, amen. The accumulation of personal wealth is unrelated to God's blessings or purposes. Hogwash, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. If you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. One of the greatest blessings in my life is my family who follows Jesus. I was blessed by Courtney for an impromptu speech getting up here and talking about hearing the voice of God. Oh, man, hallelujah. I mean, I want all of my grandchildren to follow Jesus. I want all of my grandchildren to be destined for the throne of God. I want all my grandchildren to be worshipers of the Lord God. I want all my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, to open the book of life. I want all of them to have a biblical world view. They have a filter where they make decisions and understand life through the word of God. Can you say amen? Very quickly, how do we respond to the decline of Christianity in America? Very quickly, don't be surprised or troubled in your heart. Now, I have to admit, I was sharing with Diane, I read that report by George Barn. I said, golly, looks like America is going to hell in a handbasket. And God says, don't worry about it. I got it. His prophetic message in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 through 7 don't be surprised as we come near the end of time, the consummation of the age. He says, let no man deceive you. People will fall away from the faith. The spirit of Antichrist will even be in the church. And the mystery of lawlessness will manifest itself. Those things are happening right now. More so than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. So God says in his parables in his teaching he says the word of God is a seed that was planted in the field and he says also the enemy came and he planted his seed in the field so in this world we have believers and non-believers and so the preacher said well, I'm going to get rid of all those unbelievers let's tear those weeds out God said leave it alone be patient be faithful he says, at the end of time, I'll send my angels and I'll separate the wheat from the tares. Just live for me. Don't become the judge and jury we so often do. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. See, God is the determiner. Amen. My prayer now that if we have to come under severe judgment in America, that will bring us to our knees, so be it that people will come to the saving grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Amen. We need in America a heaven sent, sky blue move of the Holy Ghost that will change and transform so many people who have been deceived and led astray. Please stand.